Hi everyone, and welcome to Himal Podcasts. I'm Raisa Vikramatunga, and I'm here with Sunil Amrit, the Renu and Anand Dhawan Professor of History and current chair of the South Asian Studies Council at Yale University. We're actually chatting with Sunil as part of the special issue we're working on, on South Asia post-pandemic. Welcome to Himal Podcast, Sunil. Thank you for having me, Raisa. So just to start off, in your book, Unruly Waters, you note how the history of water is more than a mirror to human intentions. The history of water shows that nature has never truly been conquered. What would you say are some of the factors that have contributed to the growing frequency of these events? I think there are two things we need to consider. Um, The first is the question of of whether there is a change in the climatic patterns going on. And the second is is really to focus on the social and economic changes that might magnify the impact of each one of these events. Um, So in terms of the the changing patterns of cyclones, this is clearly a subject of ongoing research and and some uncertainty and debate within climate science. Um, I'm not a climate scientist, but my best understanding of of the state of research is that there is no clear trend towards an increasing frequency of cyclones, but there does seem to be a trend towards increasing intensity of cyclones. And I think that what we've seen across South Asia over the last several years is a rise in extremes of both wet and dry, and sometimes both simultaneously, and we've seen a rise in unevenness um, and and spatial variation. Uh, Some of this is clearly being driven by global warming, Some of it is also being driven by by natural variability in the global climate system, by El Nino and by uh, the Madden-Julian oscillation. The second thing though is, you know, the question of of social and economic history and how much, you know, we can think of these as engineered disasters. I think if we look at the Mumbai floods of 2005, uh, the Chennai floods, the, the Pakistan floods of 2010, they're very strong, elements uh, in which the damage that they caused were because of an interaction between uh, the cyclones themselves and these engineered landscapes. Um, These uh, successive and and sort of generational attempts to control water, I think, which have ended up backfiring in many ways. So, for example, you see uh, flooding is worsened by the uh, elimination of various forms of natural drainage, uh, by the destruction of mangroves along the coast. You see a sort of relentless construction in coastal zone, often in violation of coastal zone regulations, with uh, a number of the river delta cities in South Asia, um, that they're sinking very fast. And they're sinking because of groundwater extraction, uh, because of, of water engineering further upstream. Uh, So I think that we need to think about the intersection between the changing climate change, changing patterns of cyclones and extreme weather, and uh, the human institutions and infrastructures that that might worsen their impact. Um, Finally, this is not a wholly negative story. I think we do need to point to one uh, quite astonishing success, really, which is the uh, massive reduction in the death toll from cyclones that we've seen in South Asia since the 1970s. And I think Bangladesh has, has done especially well in this. And what has caused that massive reduction in the death toll from cyclones is, is very simple, in some ways, unglamorous interventions. This has to do with cyclone shelters. It has to do with the impact of, of mobile phones um, allowing the authorities to warn people. It has to do with incremental improvements in, in forecasting. And I think the point that you made about it being more an issue of extremes rather than growing frequency is quite interesting and leads to the next question that I had, which is also related to unruly waters. It also talks about this disease of gigantism and how the process of development has widened the gap between rich and poor post-independence in a way unconsciously following colonial projects. Would you say that that's still true? It's interesting that phrase, the disease of gigantism, actually came from Nehru himself, and and he said it, I think, in 1958. And it seemed to sort of indicate a change of heart on his own part. And Nehru's so much associated with that reverence for for big dams, for example, you know, that famous quotation that he saw them as the temples of the new India. But here he is in 1958, and he points out that, you know, it may be that the small projects uh, taken together Uh, have as much impact on improving people's lives as these gigantic projects. I do think it's still true. Um, Statistically, I think it looks like the 1970s were probably the peak of dam construction, certainly in India. 
But what we've seen happening over the last 15 or 20 years is in fact a sort of move to dam the, the upper reaches of the mountain rivers, which are of course you know, quintessentially cross-border rivers. And this wasn't technically possible or financially feasible until the 1980s. That's true in China as well as in India. It's only in the 1980s uh, that the Chinese government starts to think about building these large dams in, on the Tibetan plateau. And it's only in the 1980s and 90s uh, that the Indian government, but then also in Nepal, um, and Bhutan, uh, that the sort of mountain rivers begin to be dammed. And this comes with, with enormous risks, needless to say, and they're seismically active zones. Uh, there are huge risks to communities downstream that come from any one of these projects. Um, uh, one projection suggested the Himalayas might be the most heavily dammed region in the world by the middle of this century. The clustering of those projects um, comes, especially in a context of increasing climate extremes, with major risks. Um, I think the question of, of inequality is, is crucial. One of the things that we know very well is the sheer number of people that have been dis, uh, displaced by these gigantic projects. Um, one estimate done for the Indian case is of about 40 million people displaced from their homes between 1947 um, and uh, some point in the past decade by large projects, mostly by dams. And needless to say, this displacement, it does not fall on everyone equally. Other Varsi communities have of course been particularly uh, affected by, by the displacement and also least likely to gain adequate compensation. But the other thing I would say is, you know, yes, the disease of gigantism is still there. You only need to look at India's river linking project to see that that particular imagination, the river linking project is quite explicitly linked back to this uh, British hydraulic engineer, Arthur Cotton, who was working in, in um, Andhra and Tamil Nadu in the uh, middle of the 19th century. So that, that legacy is still there. But there's another story, which is to say that, of course, across South Asia, there is a deep and fundamental questioning of those projects, and there has been since the 1970s. And I think that that critique is very well elaborated. I think that critique is increasingly um, widely known. And so I think there is this other story that, you know, yes, the disease of gigantism is still with us, but so is the critique of gigantism. And that, too, you can trace back to the 1950s and 60s, and that has only gathered force since the late 20th century with the, the rise and rise of, of environmental movements across the region and in fact their interconnection with one another as well. Speaking of interconnection, you talk of modern boundaries which are not following the history of the interconnectedness of the region, for example through the Bay of Bengal. Do you think the responses to the current crisis and other crises should also recognize this and what would solutions and mitigation look like? In some ways I think you've got to the heart of the question that lingers in the background of so much of the work that I've done. Because a lot of my work is about how both social and ecological phenomena are on a scale that doesn't map directly onto the scale of policy making and intervention, which is overwhelmingly, of course, the scale of a nation state. Um, and I would love us to think of, of multiple overlapping regions, uh, you know, depending on the phenomena we're interested in. So for example, if it's environmental change we're most interested in, then surely it makes sense to think of the Himalayan river basins as in some sense a region. If we're interested in coastal change and the particular risks and challenges faced by coastal communities, then perhaps the Bay of Bengal Rim would be a natural region to think about. When it comes to migration, of course, the, the map of migration is, is very, very different from the map of contemporary borders. Um, in a review that he wrote of my book, uh, it's a very generous review, uh, Rohan D'Souza does end by, by wondering if I had been somewhat naive to argue that uh, what we need to deal with some of South Asia's water issues is more cross-border cooperation. He points out that perhaps it's only the nation state that can protect South Asia's water resources from a, a free-for-all appropriation by the forces of global capitalism. And I think Rohan might be right there. Um, at the same time, I, I do feel like we could be far more creative in imagining what the scale of regional cooperation and regional institutions uh, looks like. Um, I should be clear that I don't think there's much chance of this happening in the current climate. Yeah. I also wanted to talk about one of the stories that made headlines, uh, which was of migrant workers who were stranded at borders or you know, walking on foot to reach their hometowns. And since you've also written a little bit about the history of migration, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that history in the region and some of the factors that have shaped migration in the past. 
I mean, I think the whole region, and this is, you know, to go beyond South Asia, to think about South and Southeast Asia, to think about South Asia and West Asia, the whole region has been tied together by migration, um, arguably for centuries, and, and certainly throughout the 19th and 20th centuries on a very large scale. And I think there are some long-term continuities in the causes of migration. Um, one of them is, is debt. And I think that remains at the heart of so many of the movements that particularly um, working class migrations are oriented around uh, huge amounts of family indebtedness, which of course, uh, in some ways strengthens the power of labor recruiters and then subsequently employers. And that was true in the 19th century. That's how indentured labor was recruited from India. I think family networks remain really crucial to understanding migration, You know why it is that people from a particular place end up migrating to, um, some destinations and not others. And this, these, the migration is, is deeply patterned. And the historian Adam McEwen uh, used the uh, metaphor of grooves of migration. This is something I've always liked because I think that's right. They tend to, they tend to become self-perpetuating over time. The other uh, commonality that I think roots hist uh, con connects historical experiences of migration with contemporary ones is the fact that so much Asian migration is circular. And that is what I think really has been um, so evident to us during the pandemic, uh, which is to say um, that you have people both stuck outside borders um, and stuck within borders. And, and I think that this makes us rethink borders in many ways, because in some sense, you know, you have migrant workers in the Middle East from South Asia or indeed in, in Southeast Asia who either can't get home or who are deported, who are forcibly sent home. You have migrant workers in urban areas of India who are given hours to return home, it immediately sort of indicating that they were not accepted um, in places that they worked in the cities, they were seen as outsiders, that these borders are not just physical borders, but they are, are mental borders, they're borders of exclusion. Um, and what we see is, is I think that this is playing out in a way that makes us think again about the very clear distinction between internal and international migration. I think there are ways in which the pandemic has uh, made us see the relatedness of both internal movements and international movements. I think the visibility of migrant workers through this crisis is really double edged. Um, optimistically, one could see that, you know, it has made so many people around the world, and this is not true just in South Asia, it's true in the major cities of the Western world as well, it's made people see how dependent they are on migrant workers. This whole um, idea of an essential worker, which has emerged through the pandemic, so many of them are migrants. You know, ideally, this leads to a greater appreciation of the value of the work that migrant workers do and their crucial role in, in all of our communities. But I worry that in fact, what we will see is in fact an intensification of a sense of difference and exclusion. There's actually been a lot of stories around climate migration in the recent past. Um, in particular, you made an interesting point, which was that migrants might have actually been agents of environmental history. Could you unpack that a little? Sure. I mean, that was a phrase I, I think I used in, in my book, Crossing the Bay of Bengal, and it's actually something that I've continued to dwell on and work through ever since then. Um, I meant, when I said migrants are themselves agents of environmental history, I think I meant it in two senses. The first was simply the observation that periods of the most rapid environmental destruction in modern times have coincided with the most intensive exploitation of, of labor, the most intensive exploitation of by some people of, of other people. Um, and that insight really came to me first from reading a Judith, Judith Shapiro's work, um, a book called Mao's War on Nature, which was talking about the you know, extraordinary environmental devastation that happened during uh, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. And, and she, again, makes a small comment about how the, you know, the abuse of nature and the abuse of people uh, up, go hand in glove. And, and that was a real insight that stayed with me when I went back to, to thinking about the history of um, migration from South Asia to, to Southeast Asia. And the fact, you know, I was reading uh, Malaysian environmental historians talking about the three great deforestations in Malaysian history, one in the late 19th century, one during the Second World War, and then one in the late 20th century. And each one of those great deforestations, if you want to call them that, um, coincides with an intensification of, of exploitation. So, so that was one sense in which I wanted to sort of make that connection. Even today, you see this with mining. You know, mining is clearly one of the most ecologically destructive activities uh, that we as human beings undertake. Uh, mining, of course, is also 
uh, one of the most exploitative industries in terms of how workers are treated. So I wanted to make that link. But the second way in which I wanted to think of migrants as agents of environmental history is that migrant labor reshapes landscapes around the world. And that this is actually central to how migrants themselves made meaning of migration. And what I mean by that is if I, I spent a lot of time collecting oral histories from uh, former plantation workers in Malaysia, many of whom had migrated in the 1920s, and 1930s. And for almost every single one of them, the way they tell their stories, they tell their stories through the way their labor changed the land. And that itself then can become uh, the basis on which to make claims of citizenship and belonging. Uh, you have a, a, a way of thinking about this where migrant workers say, we made this land what it is. Our sweat and blood made this land what it is. Um, of course, this is our country too. So in that sense, I want to think of, of the reshaping of landscapes, not simply in terms of environmental destruction, but you know, even the most destructive of these processes um, ends up being a part of the life experiences of those who are involved in these, often against their will, often working in very exploitative connections, but, but they're also making meaning out of the landscapes that are created. And I think that is something that the anthropo anthropologists have shown. I think it's very important to think about that dimension of this as well. But finally, one of the things I've just been really motivated to do is to point out that this idea of climate migration is, can be a very reductive concept. I, I, it's so difficult to abstract climate change as a singular cause of migration. Uh, clearly in the past and in the present, um, climate or, or environmental harm, environmental toxicity um, intersects with so many other things which lead people to uproot themselves and to leave their homes. And whether these are economic pressures or, or questions of debt or questions of, of coercion, questions of state coercion, of marginalization of particular uh, communities. So I worry when we talk about climate migrants that we um, create an idea that, that, that people are, are purely victims, that they don't um, have that creative agency that I think every one of these communities clearly does have. And I'm always struck in the work that I do that the, the simplest question, why did you migrate, is perhaps the hardest to answer for anyone, for any one of us. It's true in, in my own life as well, that I think there's so many different causes that sort of shape migration and that shape the particular routes that people take, that it, it is helpful, I think, to, to, to be cautious with phrases like climate migration. Do you think that there's any similarities between the oral histories you've create, uh, you've kind of collected from the past and what's happening now? I think one commonality is 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 clearly that networks matter that migration is not always a viable option for people who face environmental disasters. And I mean, I think this is one of the things that does tie the past and the present. Um, you know, if you read some of the media discourse about climate migration, you imagine that, you know, uh, climate change happens and then vast numbers of people are on the move. It doesn't work like that at all. In fact, I think the far greater risk is people who can't move, is people who are, are stuck is people who, for whatever reason, whether that is because of, of disability, whether that is because of, of absolute marginalization, because of it's uh, a lack of the, you know, the sometimes quite substantial capital one needs to be able to make these moves. Um, I think it is more likely that, that the most vulnerable people in the world uh, will not be climate migrants at all. They will in fact be, be immobilized. And I think that is something that does tie the past and the present. Uh, one difference of course, is the sheer pace of, of, of environmental change. I mean, anthropogenic climate change is, is showing its effects in a, in a brutal way in South Asia now. And, and that is not the case when I'm talking about the 19th century. You know, those were um, for, for better or worse um, natural phenomena, which nevertheless only become natural disasters when they're mediated through uh, social and cultural and political institutions. In what ways would you say the pandemic has exacerbated in inequality? I think the pandemic has exacerbated inequality in, in the most visceral way, um, because it, it suddenly becomes clear if, if everybody is ordered to go home, you know, what that home means is as good an illustration as any of the stark inequalities that divide South Asia and indeed that divide every society that I know well. 
if people are told to socially distance, how possible is it for people to be distant when they live in crowded conditions in crowded cities? Um, when people are told to take precautions, that's fine if, if you're an academic who can teach by Zoom from home. It's not fine if, if you have no choice but to go to work. I also want to talk a little bit about one of your older books, Decolonizing Public Health. And one of the things that you talk about is how the internationalization of public health through organizations like the WHO wasn't you know, smooth as is sometimes suggested and rather it relied quite heavily on local agency and improvisation. Do you see similarities in the obstacles the South Asian region has faced during this pandemic in terms of response? Absolutely. I mean, I think if, if anything, this current crisis has really flagged up the fragility and the weakness of, of international public health institutions. And, you know, let's put aside the Trump regime's sort of obscene antics and defunding of the WHO. I think even uh, sympathetic and sensible observers would see that the WHO has really lacked the capacity and the authority to coordinate international responses to this pandemic. Uh, what we've seen is, is quite the opposite. In fact, we've seen a kind of real re-emergence of a kind of public health nationalism. And it makes me actually think that what we need to illuminate this is, is perhaps a, an older style of comparative history. I mean, about 20 or more years ago, Peter Baldwin wrote a book called Sickness and the State, in which he made the argument that um, it's a very strong patterning to different national responses to public health crises. And I think you see this, uh, if you look at Europe, for example, you know, look how differently Sweden and Finland have handled the pandemic. You know, neighboring countries, um, each with a very different tradition of, of uh, infrastructure and thinking about public health and you know, Sweden has been very, very laissez-faire with the pandemic. Finland uh, has been very proactive and responsive. And I think we can see this across South Asia. We can see the strong regional differences within countries and certainly among countries. We can see the, the weakness of rural health infrastructures, which was something that even in earlier in the 20th century always was a real sort of limit and a break on how far these international campaigns could go. Uh, needless to say, we've already talked about this. You see um, the, the starkness of inequalities in terms of health outcomes, in terms of access to medical care. Um, and if there's one lesson I take from that much earlier work of mine on, on the history of public health and, and international health interventions, uh, the lesson is actually one looking forward, which is that, you know, if and when we do have a vaccine, uh, that will not be a simple panacea. I, I think a vaccine... Mm -hmm. We all hope that we will we have a vaccine for this for this infection soon. But uh, rolling out that vaccine, giving people universal access to it, persuading people that it's safe, uh, these are all um, eminently social and political concerns. And um, there's no uh, straightforward way that this is going to play out, I don't think, certainly based on historical precedent. Do you think that more enduring crises like climate change, are they getting buried due to this crisis? And what do you think the cost of that would be? So I think there are a number of things that have been very interesting about this pandemic in relation to climate change, these more enduring uh, longer term challenges. The first is, is the contrast. I mean, the pandemic exploded every argument that had for years and years and years been trotted out, um, particularly by Western governments, uh, to justify inaction against climate change. It's too expensive. We can't shut down our economies. In fact, when, when it came to the pandemic, um, you know, even the US government did this for, for a chunk of time and, and governments around the world did this. So in some sense, it really sort of exploded that idea that economic interests will always prevail over anything else. Um, on the other hand, there's also, this is common even just from the history of health that, that epidemics are dramatic, epidemics are scary, epidemics attract attention in a way that chronic diseases don't. So, you know, precisely that. Nobody's talking about the kind of crisis of, of the number of lives that are being lost to air pollution, for example, or we talk about it much, much less than we're talking about the pandemic, certainly do a lot less about it. So I think there is that sense that you know, immediate crises are easier for maybe for all of us and certainly for our media to understand and um, respond to then longer term crises. And perhaps climate change in that sense is a sort of longest term crisis of all. Um, Rob Nixon uses this phrase slow violence to talk about climate change and other such environmental disasters. And I think that's just right. Um, and, and, you know, in some ways, I think maybe even just rhetorically, I think maybe there was a certain 
smugness to how some of us said, oh, look, you know, the air's cleared up during this pandemic. You know, people were really suffering from the shutdown of their economies during March and April across the world. And I think that that, uh, you know, there was a certain way of writing about the fact that the skies are blue again and we don't see airplane trails and, and the air quality is improving in a way that may have seemed that it was sort of minimizing the human suffering that came with that. I mean, I think one of the things that this has made clear to, to so many of us is simply that, you know, the only way to deal with, with climate change is, is massive, massive investment. Um, not the kind of sudden shutdowns that we've seen in this pandemic. First of all, as you've, as you've said, you know, they don't last. Uh, second of all, they cause enormous suffering and harm. Um, so, you know, really it, it has strengthened the, uh, the arguments of those who for a long time uh, been, been arguing for a kind of massive, massive investment in uh, climate change mitigation. Again, I'm not sure the political circumstances at the moment are propitious for that. And I do think there are ways in which the pandemic has been so traumatic for so many places around the world that the, you know, the appetite to think about uh, a long term, ultimately far graver crisis like climate change is, is perhaps not there at the moment. Why do you think environmental history is important? And do you think that there are lessons here that can be applied for the current situation and the future as well? So um, early on in the pandemic, Pratap Mehta wrote a wonderful essay on the pandemic in which he makes the point that, you know, our identity as a species is, is mastery. And that even when the pandemic makes clear, in a sense, how vulnerable, how porous we are uh, to nature, in this case, to a pathogen, um, our instinct is to think, OK, well, we need to turn to immediately to a sort of to a vaccine. We will science will fix this. So our, our identity as a species is mastery. And of course, in some ways, the kind of thrust of environmental history is to show uh, that 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 isn't the case. And perhaps that could never be the case. Um, one of the big questions that I think environmental history might help us to address is this, you know, how did one part of humanity, you know, the wealthiest part of humanity, come to believe that it was immune from, from natural limits, from planetary boundaries? Um, so, you know, I think there's a history of ideas there to be told, a history of, of how, you know, the, the most powerful sections of, of the world came to feel sort of alienated or indeed in, in control of, of nature. The second thing I think environmental history can teach us is, is, is paradox. Because, you know, of course, some of our greatest gains as humanity comes with, with controlling the environment. If you think about our control over various disease environments in the 20th century, that's led to a, a huge increases in life expectancy around the world, including in South Asia. In fact, the problem there is that these increases have not been equitable enough and they haven't gone fast enough. So th there is a real paradox here, and that too comes from our control over the environment, over nature. But at the same time, environmental history shows us the many, many unintended consequences of every single one of these attempts to dominate nature. Uh, so for example, it's quite clear that COVID-19 is like so many other pandemics, um, a result of, of environmental destruction. It's the result of um, interference with, with animal habitats. That's what's allowed for so many uh, spillover events. And the ecologist Kate Jones at UCL in London has, uh, done a statistical analysis of the sheer number of these spillover events that have jumped to human hosts since the 1960s has shown a very, very clear correlation between that and you know, the invasion by, by human settlements, by human infrastructure of all sorts of habitats. So there are those kinds of unintended consequences. And all of the work that I've done in the environmental history of water too, I think you know, unintended consequences are a major um, theme that, that come out of that. And so in terms of lessons, I don't know that there are practical lessons to be learned for environmental history so much as um, a lesson that, that understanding environmental history uh, might, I hope, lead us towards sort of greater humility in some of these projects to subdue and to conquer nature, seeing that these have untold and unintended consequences. So I wanted to kind of end by asking you how you think the pandemic will shape South Asia in the future in terms of issues like climate change, migration, and inequality? At, at my most optimistic, I think this can, this must be an opening 
uh, for those voices that for, have for a long time been calling for, for example, a more equitable healthcare system, for the importance of cross-border cooperation, for a more expansive view of, of security, thinking about human security as well as military security, uh, for those voices that have pointed out that environmental destruction will inevitably have an impact on our own well-being and on our health. I mean, I think if ever there was a moment for these voices to be heard, that this is one. Um, my fear, though, is that the crisis will, we've already talked about the ways in which it might accelerate inequality. I think this has already been the case. I mean, I saw a news item recently that the period since March has seen possibly the biggest transfer of wealth, the biggest gains in wealth ever by the, you know, by the 0.1%. The second is, I think, that the emer emergency health measures that have been taken have been taken in an atmosphere of rising authoritarianism across South Asia and indeed across the world, including right here in the United States. Um, and I think this is a real risk that some of these emergency health measures may in some way or other be made permanent. The sort of systematization and control of minorities, migrants and the vulnerable. Um, the stigmatization of particular populations. So I, I worry about the climate of fear, indeed the climate of misinformation that we've seen. Um, finally, I think the economic damage of, of the pandemic has been profound and will be very long lasting. And that too will um, shape inequality, but will also of course shape politics across the region. Thank you so much for joining us, Sunil. Thank you so much, Raisa, thanks for having me.